Svetozar Gligoric of Yugoslavia, Robert Byrne of the United States of America, two characters almost out of an Ernest Hemingway novel. Gligoric, who fought in the mountains of Yugoslavia with Tito during the Second War, Robert Byrne, who among many other things is a bullfighting aficionado. Tonight they are in a vital game in Group A. A win for either could really put the pressure on Nigel Short, who still has that half-point lead in this group. With me, as usual, Bill Hartston. Bill, these two have met a lot in the past. Who tends to win? No one. <laughs> Nearly all the games have been drawn. In fact, there's only been one decisive result in 15 or 20 games between them. That was a win for Byrne. Was he playing with black or white then, do you happen to know? He was white. All the games with, with Gligorich White have been drawn. But of course, the draw is no good to either of them today. No? Well, the game's already started, in fact. They're up to uh, somewhere around about move 14. Let's uh, have a look at how they got there, first of all. With Bill. Well, Burns started with a rather different opening from what he usually plays. He usually plays the King's Indian, but this is a Queen's Gambit. The task of both players in any opening is just to bring their pieces into play as quickly as possible and to gain control of the important central squares. In the Queen's Gambit, we haven't quite reached a Queen's Gambit yet. We're here now with Black's next move. What White uses his C pawn to try to lure the Black D pawn away from the center. Black's not taking here yet. He wants to keep a very solid game in the middle. Black's already castled, keeping his king safe. And now he shows his intention to develop his bishop on b7 on the diagonal. And this is, this is really where the action starts. White must, White now decides to do something about this, this long diagonal to prevent this bishop. His, his plan now is to kill this bishop. He starts with a couple of captures. First taking the knight on f6. Now the knight was defending this pawn and white now took that. Just to make sure black is left with a pawn on d5 blocking the bishop. So this bishop development is no longer so effective. And now Gligoric shows his plan. His plan is to take control of this diagonal leading to the black king. He starts first with a strange looking rook move to bring the rook out the way. Rook to d1. We'll see the reason for this in a moment. Something slightly eccentric from Byrne here. Strange development of his queen side. This is part of the plan. The rook came to d1 just so that it isn't trapped on a1. And now Gligorich has completed his opening plan. The queen and bishop lined up on this diagonal pointing all the way to the black king, and now he's actually threatening mate on h7. And if it were possible for Gligoric to get away with that and administer a mate, it would in fact be the first time when these two have met, as Bill was saying earlier on, with Gligoric with the white pieces, that there'd been a result, and a very dramatic result it would be to have a mate. Anyway, let's join the game now with Robert Byrne, one move away from being defeated, play his 14th move as black. Is he really going to try to mate me? Well, in any case, uh, I'm going to have to play g6. Uh, it looks just a little bit too way out to play rook e8, queen h7, check, king f8. Uh, I just, even if it isn't good on this move, I can't go on permanently allowing that. So I... I'm going to play g6 now for h4. I'll go ahead with h5. And that sacrifice with g4, that's the only way to open lines there. It doesn't look right, because I interpolate knight b4, queen d2, and then take on g4. No, that can't be right. Therefore, g6. Well, it is to be expected, but... Uh I can't try h4. I know from some other lines, analyze that attack. 
uh, in another similar position and I uh, think that uh, black can defend easily and it's too risky. I mean, I should castle uh, straight away and uh, complete my development. So I'll castle. Well, often in this kind of formation, uh, white plays for a break with e4. Uh, is he going to do that now? I don't think so, but uh, eventually that's going to come. And uh, I think I'd better put some added protection on the e4 square. Therefore, rook e8. Well, I feel I'm better here, but uh, what should I do really? Should I put the rook on d2 and uh, have the square uh, d1 for my queen? Or is it a little bit artificial? Maybe I should bring my queen right away to d2, which uh, and it ties then at the pawn on h6, and I can open eventually the position in the center. I would like him to block the position in the center, but he keeps it. Uh, uh, he keeps the pawn tension. Well, uh, I think I should. Uh, I should remove my queen from the exposed square once more because he will bring his rook on the c file anyhow. Should I play rook d2 or should I play queen d2? Queen d2 looks uh, somehow more natural. I try that one. Mm, yes, he couldn't leave the queen on the open. C line forever since my next move is going to be rook c8 almost no matter what he plays. That's the only good square. Queen e2, knight b4 would threaten bishop a6. So queen d2. Now, I don't want to block up this position too early. I don't want to play c4 because that will add some strength to a break by him with rook e1 and e4. Besides, I feel very comfortable here. I have uh, quite a, a free position with, with all pieces working reasonably well, and I would like to keep the tension. Now, if I play rook c8, he can't do very much by taking on c5. I have several reasonable ways of replying to that. I can just simply recapture with a knight on c5, and on knight takes d5, I exchange the queens, bishop for knight, and take the pawn on b2, that should be easily sufficient for black. But also, after rook c8, dc, I can take immediately bishop takes c3, queen takes c3, knight takes c5, and then of course I have an isolated pawn, but uh, I'm quite well developed. I, I don't think that would uh, give any really good possibilities to white. Besides, I would be threatening there bishop a6, rook e1, knight d3, winning the exchange. No, oh, rook, rook c8, that's the best chance for mobilization. Rook c8. Oh, this is very daring. I mean, I thought he would play knight c7 first and bring that knight into play. Can he do it uh, so easily when his pawn on d5 is... Uh, under pressure and uh, threatened to be captured. It is strange that his position works so well by now. Well, maybe I should develop, he'll develop his rook, so maybe I should develop my last rook too, because I don't see anything that I can do right away. So I'll play rook f e1. Now there's some possibility of playing for e4 here. I, I don't really think it's strong, but I want to take precaution nevertheless. That move, of course, made no difference to the strength or weakness of my d-pawn, so I can forget about that for the moment. I think that I should just solidify this position by, say, bishop g7. That way, if he were to play e4 and I captured, and eventually a knight ended up on e4, it would not be attacking the bishop. So I would not be losing a tempo if that bishop were back on g7. All right, besides, I can't undertake anything more active at this early stage, so bishop g7. It is strange. I uh, begin to dislike my position slightly because I don't see I can make a break with e4, which I intend in eventually, because then his bishops, uh, be, uh, after the opening of the position, bishops be, begin to work very effectively. I don't see what, what I can do right away. 
maybe it's not the best. I don't like to play a three because I put my uh, my pawns on dark squares and he has a dark square bishop for the end of the game. But maybe it's necessary because I have to do something to improve my position and to attack his uh, d5 pawn, which was my main uh, target. All right, I play i3. Well, I can see that I just haven't provoked Gliga into taking on c5 and getting my pieces into the game, which is what I was really hoping for. Now, the next step is to get that errant knight into play. a3, well, that prevented any... Uh, any transport of that knight to b4. So if I play knight c7, it not only reinforces the d-pawn, but perhaps I can do something with knight e6 later on. I don't really think I can put effective pressure on the d-pawn, but anyway, this knight has to get better play. Knight c7. Well, he plays everything that uh, black should do. I mean, I played this line with bl as black in the past, and uh, I always tended to put my knight on e6 and have a very good position. So I don't like that. What can I do? If I open the position with e4, so again it will be, it will favor him. I mean, he has good good bishops there. And. Uh, well, maybe I, I should keep the position closed, whatever it is, although I don't feel I have an advantage anymore. I'll try bishop a2. I don't really like that bishop a2, because it's putting more pressure on the d-pawn, and I, it was not part of my plan to play c4 and block up the position in this game. I was hoping to get a, a free, open, mobile pawn center, which would give me some chance to use those bishops. If I play c4, it's going to be a position where the bishops are not going to do much. But what else? Well, in any case, he just isn't going to give me what I want. Uh, there's no way I'm going to get an open position here, so I might as well just get ready to play a closed one. c4. Well, unfortunately, black has to do that, but it's a good move. I mean... Uh he has space here, and he's threatening b5, and I intend anyhow to block his uh, pawn formation on the queen side. So I play a4, that's the only move. Right, now I can't get a pawn roller going with b5, b4, and so on. I mean, I didn't expect, of course, that he would allow me to do that to him, but uh, this makes it very clear. But I do get something out of this. Now the square b4 is weakened, and I can do better than playing knight e6. I can play knight a6 and head back into what's now a nice protected outpost at b4. Yes, knight a6. Interesting, Bill, how the number of good moves that each player had has been reduced over the last few moves, and how they've managed almost to suffocate each other. Yes, it's, it's interesting to see this knight going backwards and forwards. Um, I like Black's position here. I think he's got more, more of what he wanted than, than what Gligoric is doing. What White seems to be a bit planless now. Uh, it's, it's characteristic of these positions with two bishops against bishop and knight. Um, bishops need open space, so Black wants an open position. And so Gligoric is avoiding playing this e4 opening of the game. Now Black's got more space on the queen side. His pawns cover very well. Gligorich was saying he was beginning to dislike his position a little bit. Let's go back to the game with him to play his 21st move and see if he can improve it. Well, it's a good move again. I mean, uh, my only idea of getting some play was to play b3, but it doesn't work now because he will play knight b4, and I saw that, and if I take on c4, he will take my bishop on a2. I take with the queen, he will take with the rook on c4. He will have a very good game. So it's nothing to do. Uh, probably I have to remove my bishop back, see whether I can do something in the center. Bishop b1. Let's see, if I play knight b4, which was of course the, the right consequence to knight a6, and he plays e4, I capture without any difficulty. He can't capture with a knight, because then I play f5, forcing a retreat of the knight, Capture on f3, smashing up his king's side pawns. Now that, of course, is bad for him. 
So if he plays e4, d, e, and captures with a bishop, then I just capture on d5. A knight takes d5. I can simply play knight b4. And now that the... No, what am I doing? My knight's already on b4 in that variation. Oh, that would be bad for him. If the knight's already on b4, it goes directly to d3, attacking the rook on e1. Beautiful outpost. And it cuts off his support of the d-pawn. No, that has to be bad for him. Knight b4. I don't like this. Well, I have to think now what I could do. I have to think a long, long time because I am worse here, I must say. I'm worse. I have no action. He has more space. What should I do? If I play maybe rook c1 and queen d1, it's all slow. Maybe it's good, maybe not. I don't know, but I, I don't do anything. And I have no error on the king side. Well, I know from my experience in the Royal Lopez when I play black, when having little error, I play usually g6. Now, for the opposite side, it should be g3. Maybe I should do that. But it's risky. I weaken my king side in the light squares. I want to play knight h4, knight g2, and something like that to improve my knight and uh, put some pressure on his uh, d5 pawn, which was my dream. Well, I'll do g3, I think. Well, this is a good position, but what to do with it? The pawn roller is impossible after his a4. Perhaps I can develop some kind of attack against his king. Now, g3. Is he thinking of some sacrifice with knight e5? That, uh, let's see, knight e Suppose I play queen d7. That mobilizes the last piece. And then if knight e5, bishop takes e5, d e, rook takes e5, e4, relying on the pin. But that should be dangerous for white because I can then play queen h3, and if f4, rook h5, I'm protecting my d-pawn, I'm piling up pieces against his king. No, that can't be correct. Right, queen d7. Well, that's clear. I, uh, my only chance, uh, tactical one, knight e5, doesn't work. And he's threatening bishop c6 and to, to capture my pawn. I spent so much time before I should play now quickly. And the only way to defend my pawn is to play rook c1, the free square d1 for the queen. So I play rook c1. Right. I may want to switch my bishop to the king side if I'm going to attack there. Perhaps uh, queen h3, bishop c6, bishop d7, bishop g4 or f5, something like that. Well, it ought to begin with it ought to begin with bishop c6. Therefore, bishop c6. I have nothing to think about. I play queen d1 as intended to defend my pawn. Now, what's the correct plan? Queen h3 immediately. That's a point to drag the bishop around behind it. But on queen h3, well, if he plays king h1, I can't stay. I play knight g1 and kick me out of there. And then maybe even f3 and e4. I can't go to sleep over that. Uh, it's a good position, but uh, a little sleep will wreck any position. So I have to stay alert to his possibilities here. Well, now that would work if I could hamper his king pawn so badly he couldn't dream of advancing it. So, that's what I'm going to do. First, before anything else, I'm going to double rooks on the E-line, therefore rook E7. Well, my intention is to play. I am worse, but uh, he's, he's not threatening yet anything. And uh, I might play knight h4, and eventually, if I can do, I would like to play f4, f5, and uh, have some tactical chance for the counter play. I try knight h4 first. Yes, that figured. And, and it does bring up the possibility of f4, f5. Uh, I don't particularly care for that. So. But anyway, my, my idea of doubling on the E-line not only mobilizes my rooks, but it kills that idea anyway. So, rook C, E8. Has Gligorich White got real chances now? Is he in better position? 
Still a little worse, I think. Black still has more space given to him by this, this advanced pawn, though the position's blocked, but Byrne has to find something to do. This is a real heavyweight Grandmaster game, this. Yes. Let's go back to it straight away with uh, Gligorich White to play. Well, it prevents me of playing uh, f4 anyhow, and it would be risky, and uh, now I would lose a pawn, I can't do that. And I can't, can't play queen d2 because my pawn on a4 is hanging, so I have to play knight g2 first. Now the pawn on e3 is defended by the knight on g2. That means he can begin to think about playing... Oh, it's awfully hard for him to do it, but he can think about working with f3 and e4. And I just don't want to be disturbed by that when I'm attacking or trying to attack <laughs> against his king. So I can't, of course, play queen h3 right away. Knight f4 just kicks it away. It's a wasted move. So I have to be able to take care of that knight when it comes to f4, several things. So I think I can play h5 with the idea of bringing my bishop to h6 to take a knight on f4. Also h5, if I can get in queen h3, I might even be able to play bishop h6 g5 or bishop f6 and h4 and open a line against his king. Right, h5. I expected that move. Well, uh, what should I do? My rook only one is pinned. I don't like to keep it there. And I would like to play f4, f5, so I'll remove my rook to f line, rook f1. Well, all right, there's no, not going to be any vertical pin on the, on the E line, too bad. I was hoping he'd try to free his position with a blunder, B3, and play CB, queen takes B3. Uh-huh, that wouldn't work as long as the knight's on G2, still defending his E1 rook. Well, I have to try to get that queen into H3, so... Nothing better. No, I must play bishop h6 to stop knight f4 so that I can play queen h3 and h4. Bishop h6. Well, I'm rather short of time, uh, and uh, I don't see I should make any action here because then it will favor my opponent. Maybe I'll wait. Well, a strange idea comes to my mind. Maybe I should just remove my king from that diagonal where he can sacrifice only three sometimes with checks. So I'll remove the king first. Maybe I'll play then rook g1 and knight f4 and so on. I'll play king h1 and wait. Well, now it is hard. It's hard to find a, a way into that position. He's not doing anything and he can't do anything much. But what am I doing? Queen h3. Well, queen h3, then knight f4. Yes, I'm, I'm pushing him, perhaps, to play knight, h, knight f4, but bishop takes f4, takes with the g-pawn, but then he can operate on the g-line. I can't get anything over there to cooperate with that queen. Unless there's some possibility later I could play bishop d7. That's not at all clear. Now, suppose I play queen g4. That prevents him from f freeing the queen side with b3, because I would simply exchange queens and take the pawn. Queen g4. If I play that, uh, well, he wouldn't be tempted to play f3. That would be a terrible move. f3, then queen h3, the e-pawn's hanging. And if he plays f4 to guard the e pawn, uh, then I play h4, and if he takes with a knight, rook takes e3, I'm chopping up his position. Now, if I play queen g4, he exchanges queens. I like the idea of getting a pawn on hg, a nice pawn on that square, cramping his position even further. Of course, I don't quite know what I'm going to do even when I get it cramped. But I think I'll give him a chance to take my queen. Queen g4. Look at this. He wants to play an endgame. Well, uh, if I exchange, he has a good pawn on h4, g4, and uh, he some pressure on h5. I don't like that. I'll keep the position intact. Uh, well, I see it now quickly. When I have I'm short of time, I see very quickly what my best move is. It is knight f4. I just keep it. And then it improve the position of my knight. And then I have pressure on his 
d5 pawn. It's a good move. I play knight f4. Oh, too bad. Too bad. There are a lot worse moves than that he could have played. Now, I don't really want to take on d1. I mean, that that's nothing. That the, the position is being maintained on both sides. And I can see that he's not going to be pushed into taking on g4. Well, if I can't push him to taking on g4, what am I going to do? With those knights bearing on my d5 pawn, it's getting harder for me to dream up a way to play bishop d7. I could play king g7, but but what am I doing? I'm fiddling. Uh, bishop g5, it comes to nothing. I can't play h4 as long as the queen needs the h pawn's protection. It's a nice looking position, but it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Is there any plan at all? King g7, rook h8, everything. Uh, I could play king g7, rook e h8, then bring the queen back, then play h4. Oh, that's too slow. That's too slow. You can get ready for that easily. Hmm. I really can't find a way to make progress here. It's funny. This is a nice position. I certainly don't want to take on f4. Bishop takes f4. That's silly. He takes back g, f. And then, once again, he's going to work on the g line. No. Well, this isn't one of my most creative days. I think I'm going to offer a draw. Well, I offer a draw. Oh, yes. I was inferior for a long time, and now I think I have a solid, solid position. Mm -hmm. Bill, that's one of those draws that I think the average player won't be able to understand at all. There's merely a knight, a bishop, and two pawns off the board, everything else there. Two players both desperately needing a win, an offer of a draw, and an acceptance. Yes, Byrne really talked himself into that one. It, it's like a couple of football teams coming off at half time and giving up because the score's still nil all. Yes. Really no excuse. They should, Byrne especially should have played on there. He is a little better. Yes. Now, you, in fact, have won this uh, Master Game twice. If you'd been playing, would you have either offered or accepted a draw in that position? Trouble with chess, really, is that the, the misery caused by losing a game is far greater than the delight you get by winning, at least for most players. Um, yeah, I think I'd have taken a draw. You would? Even uh, if you needed a win to qualify? In, in this situation, you must play on. If, if you're as good as your opponent, especially with black, you, you need to wait for mistakes anyway, of course. It's about an equal position, but you, you just have to play on. You have to steal your nerves and get on with it. Mm -hmm. Even though the pain of a defeat might be at the end of it all. Yes, you, suffered a lot, you have to suffer a lot of pain in your life as a chess player. Right, well, let's have a look at the board and see what that's done to this Group A, because it's actually made it rather interesting, this half point each for Gligorich and Byrne. It means now that they both have one and a half points, as does Nigel Short. And that means that we do have a very interesting position indeed, that if Vlastimil Hort beats Nigel Short next week, as he should do, then in that case we could have a four-way tie. That's the game next week. Nigel Short, who now needs just half a point, to very improbably qualify in this enormously strong Group A for the final of the Master Game and the possibility of winning £2,500. But he has to play Vlastimil Hort from Czechoslovakia. That's the promise for next week from all of us here in Bristol. Until then, good night.